Uh, this is Tori Hauk and Alex Hauk and Sweet Baby Isabel. And today um, we are going live from a farm field somewhere in rural Ohio uh, to talk to you about the Senior Voice for Animals badge. So today we are going to accomplish um, four of the five steps needed. So we've got to talk about domestic animals with our adorable uh, wiener dog and a pug, um, animals used for science, animal husbandry, sports and entertainment, and then when we're done, you're going to have to go back, um, research some different animal issues, and find one that is really important to you or close to your heart, and you need to advocate for that. So if that's writing an editorial or writing a speech to tell to all your friends or just advocate for it, that's what you're going to do to accomplish those steps. So. As a reminder, this is a virtual badge program. I'm gonna just aim at the puppies so you don't have to just see that. Um, this is a badge program designed for high schoolers. So we are gonna be talking about um, animal topics such as animal testing, animal husbandry, and kind of getting into the science between those topics. Um, we're gonna start with the dogs and then we're gonna head over and talk to, um, or and hang out with the cows. So, um, going to give it a couple seconds. It looks like we've got a couple viewers. Um, so while you guys are um, kind of hanging out and we're waiting for more people um, to show up, um, go ahead and write in the comments where you're from and um, what your favorite animal is. And so while you guys are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and um, let Alex introduce herself. Hi, my name is Alex, as Tori said, and I have grown up on this farm here in rural Ohio. We have some dogs and some cows. We used to have some chickens that now Ben and Tori have at their house. So it's a big family affair here at the farm. We're gonna talk about domestic animals today and some farm animals that are also domesticated. A little bit about my background. I went to Ohio State and got a degree in animal science. I've always been really passionate about animals even when I was a Daisy and Brownie and Girl Scouts. Um, so I think it's really cool that you guys are taking this social distancing time to work on your badges and accomplish something. When a lot of people are home and can't be out getting everything done, you guys are still making a difference and that makes me really proud. Um, so, okay, so uh, is everybody tuning in? What kind of viewers? Do yeah, we have? so we've got um, Nikki from Michigan. Hi, Hi Nikki. Tamara from Oregon. Uh, Melissa from Central Illinois, her favorite animal is a dolphin. Hey, Amy from Dayton. Oh, Abby from Sydney. Hey, Nerm, how's it going? Okay, um, so first, let's just start off talking about animals that we kind of know. Hey, uh, Rose from Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, so tell us about domestic animals. What's the difference between a domestic animal and a wild animal? So thousands and thousands of years ago, when people were still hunters and gatherers. The domestication of animals started when people needed a more reliable food source. So people started keeping livestock animals like cattle, sheep, pigs, and raising them for food uh, so that humans could kind of stay in one place. We didn't have to be as nomadic. And one of our favorite domesticated animals, the dog, started about 12,000 years ago from the Canis lupus, which is a gray wolf. They started coming around people's camps as they were cooking around the fire and scavenging. And as those animals bred and carried on through the generations, the animals that would come closer and closer to humans for scraps ended up having their genetics passed on through breeding. So over time, humans domesticated the wolf into what we have now, the Canis familiaris, or the basic dog. And there's a lot of variation in the domestic dog. There are very tiny dogs, very smushy dogs. <laughs> there are some very large dogs like Ben and Tori have a big poodle mix, Buddy. Um, and each of these breeds has been developed for a specific purpose. So dogs like this, the Dachshund, are here. part of the hound group and hounds were developed to help people hunt for food. So dachshunds were developed in Germany. Dox means badger and hund means dog. So they go down into these little tunnels and 
flush out the vermin for hunters to catch. It's really cool. And some other dogs, like the pug we have, were bred and developed for companionship in the toy group. And they're really good at being our best friends and being there for us when we need a little paw to hold, don't they? Yeah. And we also have bigger breeds like livestock guardian dogs that help farmers take care of their animals. There are working dogs trained for police work like German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois. And then a very popular breed, the Labrador, can do a lot of things. They can help sniff out bombs, they can do drug detection for the police. And another really important thing that dogs like Labradors and Labradoodles do is service work. So they help people by aiding them with tasks like walking across the street, turning the lights on and off. Um, awesome. Let me get my... Does anybody have any questions about uh, domestic animals? Or what kind of rights they think that domestic animals should have, like cats and dogs. Ooh, we've got someone from Colorado. Ooh, what do they Hi. Have to say? They're from Colorado. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, what are some rights that animals have, or what are some groups that advocate for animal rights? So, one of the groups in the United States that advocates for animal rights is the Humane Society of the United States. So they work together with people and companion animals like veterinarians and animal shelters to help sure, make sure that dogs have a place to live. And they also work closely with livestock producers to make sure that welfare standards are being met so that the animals we use for food production are also being treated fairly and have a comfortable place to live. Another um, group that works towards animal rights in the United States is PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and they um, look out for even things like fish and mosquitoes. At PETA, they believe everything has the right to live and be protected. Um, and some other groups that work on animal welfare is a program called FARM, so farmers Acting Responsible for Management, F-A-R-M. That is a group that works specifically with dairy cattle producers to make sure that their dairy cows are walking okay, they have plenty of clean water, they have an adequate amount of space, and that they get to interact with each other and fulfill their social needs. Um, awesome. Um, so what rights do you guys think that pets should have. You guys can go ahead and um, type them in the comments and I can read them aloud. So rights that you think that pets should have. Oh. And then one way that we protect the rights that those animals have that we, or that we believe they should have is through an act passed by the United States Congress called the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, and that protects mostly mammals that are used for research or used for work in public setting, so that applies to service animals and it makes sure that they are getting appropriate rest when they're working with their handler and also laboratory animals, so it protects the mice and the guinea pigs and the rabbits that are mm -hmm. being tested for medicine and cosmetics so that we can still make advances in human medicine, but that we're doing it ethically and making sure those animals are treated fairly while they help us develop new medicines and new cosmetics. Cool. Do you want to um, talk a little bit more about why we use animals for testing? Yes. So some medicines, when we're developing them, can have an adverse effect on humans and we don't want to necessarily subject humans to testing that isn't um, safe for their body yet. And there are a lot of animals that have very similar responses physiologically uh, like mice have a lot of similar systems and another uh, livestock animal that we do a lot of medical research on is pigs because they're very very closely related to humans so if you can test your chemo drug on a group of pigs you can see results much more quickly because the generation interval on pigs is much smaller than humans so we can raise pigs from birth to adulthood in about nine months where people take 18 years 
um, mm -hmm. to be able to participate in testing. So instead of developing medicine over 20 years and a lot of people suffering, we can develop medicines more quickly and more safely by using animals. Awesome. Um, are there any rules or regulations for animal testing? So one thing that I touched on, the Animal Welfare Act, that is like the guideline that all companies follow when it comes to testing on animals. And that mostly protects mammals. So your invertebrates or aquatic species like fish, amphibians, insects, things like that are not protected under the Animal Welfare Act, but things that in the industry are generally deemed as more sentient, so they have feelings and thoughts, are protected, and those facilities that test animals are inspected regularly by the USDA, which is the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and specifically the uh, team that works with the USDA to make sure that those guidelines are met is called APHIS, so Animal Plant Health Information. Um, <coughs> <laughs> Sorry about that interruption. Do you guys have any questions about animal testing or what type of thoughts do you have about the protection of mammals but not invertebrates or aquatic species? That's something that a lot of people like to talk about. Yeah. So uh, while you guys are typing them in, I'm just going to go read through some of the animal rights that you guys um, believe in. So we've got uh, to be fed properly, definitely safe yeah. shelter. Yes. Uh -oh. Uh, food, water, companionship, um, right to a safe home and correct nutrition. Um, I think that pets should be able to have a safe home, the right food, and a loving owner. We totally agree. Huh, don't you, Lewinette? So you guys touched on a lot of those four basics, and I really like that you guys are identifying those and know them already. Food, water, shelter, and companionship are essential for all mammals, and most animals in general really really need that companionship element too. So I'm really proud of you guys for identifying those independently. Uh, what are yeah. some animal rights issues that you guys maybe have heard about recently or? Um, we have a question from Angela okay. um, asking a little bit more about um, are reptiles and amphibians protected? So they are not nearly as closely protected as our mammal friends, so things that have fur, things that remind us of human babies, naturally over the course of human history have been favored over animals that are more towards that invertebrate scale or not what we think as cuddly pets. So I think that's something really important going forward that people are going to be advocating for those animals so that they have equal rights just like mammals um, to get a little bit more of that protection because they're so vital to our ecosystems just like animals are. Yeah, and I think that would be a great uh, step five if you guys are yeah. interested in researching animal issues and advocating for that. Yeah. That's a great thing to advocate, especially if you think about the animals in our waterways being affected, especially with the amount of rain and runoff we've had lately. Uh, that would be a really great thing to advocate for those amphibians that have those permeable um, their skin, skin that stuff really affects them yeah great so it doesn't look like we have any questions about um, animals used for science right now so let's go ahead and um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, animals that are used for sports um, so what kind of animal sports are you guys aware of so things like um, like the rodeo um, bullfighting what are things that you think of there are a lot of dog-specific sports that people can get involved in, even if they are not part of a dog community or um, they don't maybe have a background in dogs. Uh, there are things like fly ball, where you kind of play a fetch obstacle course with your dog and it gets to be on a team with other dogs and you can work together to get the fastest time. We have some of this agility equipment set up today that is a really fun obstacle course you can do with your dog. I'll see if Isabel will jump through the hoop for us. Yeah. Isabel, Isabel's doing some searching right now. So that badger hound that we talked about, her instincts, even though she is far, far away from being a gray wolf, she still has those hunting instincts because the badger hound was developed to hunt and help people stay. Isabel, come! 
yeah, so horse and dog racing, sled racing. Um, the Iditarod is happening right now. Ooh, oh, that's super exciting. Yeah, on day 12 of the Iditarod, there is an Ohio um, agility member, Laura Neese, who is running her team of 12 dogs. Uh, she's, she's originally from Newark, Ohio, and she trains her dogs in Michigan now. But so she's on day 12 running in the Iditarod. Um, and used to participate in dog sports in Ohio, like agility, uh, obedience, showing her dog at the local fair. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways to get involved as a young adult or an adolescent with dog sports and create a career out of it. This woman is um, full-time racing sled dogs, living her dream. It's really cool what you can start when you get involved in dog sports. Yeah. So um, oh, I'll let you go ahead and do your next oh, trick. Good job. Here. Come on, Good. Stay. Oh. Come on, Iz. Oh. Oh, ruin. Yeah. oh yay. Good awesome. Girl. Um, so what are Isabel and Lulu's backgrounds in competition? So Lulu started out, she's 12 now, but she started out as a little puppy showing an obedience with me at the county fair. So we'll, Lulu doesn't know too many tricks, but she knows how to lie down. Good job, Lulu. She knows sit. Good job. And Isabel knows when I have treats that if she does something, she'll get a treat. So it's a really great way to bond with your pets that you already have by participating in pet sports. Uh, this reward system, using treats and having fun with your dog is a great way to uh, get them involved and get a little bit of excitement in their life, especially in this time of social isolation. If you just take five minutes a day and practice down with your dog, practice sit, you could do a paw, you know, give paw, good girl, roll over, play dead. That's something that you could really use to pass the time and bond with your dog. Yeah, and what does Isabel do? Is she still currently competing or is she? So Isabel is not competing at this time, but during the summer we're signed up for a competition obedience class. So we're gonna train up to go into the AKC obedience, which is the American Kennel Club, and compete against other adults with their dogs in the same level. Ooh. So like Lulu, when she was showing, just got to be in on-leash obedience, but Ooh. Isabel, she showed with me for five years, fun. And so now she knows how to do obedience off-leash. And there are a lot of different levels you can reach, so there's levels with jumps, there are levels with your dog doing scent identification, so you rub your hands on a glove and the judge hides it away from the dog and mixes it up with other gloves. And then you lay them down and tell your dog, okay, go get my glove. And they sniff them all out and pick out the right glove. It's really, really interesting and fun. And you can spend a lifetime working with your dog and getting a really great, strong bond. Oh, so what does Isabel's training routine look like when you guys are in training season? So normally what I do to tell Isabel that we're getting ready to train is I change her clothes, oh. which sounds weird. But if you think about it, when you're getting ready to practice for soccer or practice for basketball, do you practice in your jeans or do you put on your athletic clothes? So Usually I, athletic clothes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> typically. <laughs> so I like to put Isabel in a different collar when we're working so that she knows my environment has changed, my mindset needs to change, and we're working now. So that's one thing that I suggest about starting a training routine is change the environment in which you're working with your animals so they know that we're not just playing or laying on the couch. We're here to have fun and work. So after I get her changed, I show her the treats so that she knows it's time to work. And then for only 10 or 15 minutes at a time, because dogs have a little bit of a shorter attention span, Isabel, come. We work and we try and set ourselves up for success. So we take small steps at a time. We start just by doing things that she knows, like how to sit, how to lay and I build her confidence. So if she knows, come on Isabel, that she is doing a good job and she's gonna get treats when she does the right thing, she's more likely to continue to do the right thing. 
So if I set that base in the first five minutes of training with things that she's already confident in and then ask her to do new tasks little by little, I can have a lot more success rather than starting a whole new day with the same outfit on in the living room and ask her to play dead. She won't know what's going on. But if I ease her into it little by little, we have a lot more success. Yeah. Good girl. Um, does anybody have any questions about um, animals and sports or training their dogs or anything like that? Or any of the other topics we've hit on? Um, so far, they are really cute and they're really smart. <laughs> yes, they definitely are. Say thank um, you. So, so far today, we've accomplished talking about domestic animals, um, animals used for science. Um, we're going to go talk about animals for husbandry in a minute. Um, and then we've already talked about sports and entertainment. So does anybody have any questions about steps one through four, or one, two, and four that we've already talked about? Oh, uh, yeah. Pups are so cute. And Isabel actually has a baby sister named Holly who is five months old and is super adorbs. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any other questions about our friends. So I think it's time to um, go ahead and head out to head out and see the cows. Yeah, talk about the cows and animal husbandry um, and kind of animal breeding and all that. Animal breeding and reproduction, exactly. Okay, so let's walk on over in the barn. And we have four cows, but we only have two in this barn. Um, two in the other barn. And actually, um, one of the cows over there is about to Get have hurt. a calf. Yep. Yeah, oh, sorry, gotta rotate back so don't confuse people. So. So we have a few different age groups and that's why they're separated into different pens here. These are all cattle and they're a specific type of cattle. So these are used for dairy, which is milk production, instead of being used for their meat. So these are not animals that are being raised to become hamburger. They are going to put milk in the bottles and cheese on your plate. These are a specific breed of dairy cattle that is a heritage breed. So they're a little bit more rare. There are not nearly as many of them as some other breeds, but it's called Ayrshire. And so they are from the Shire on the Isle of Ayr, ah. in Scotland, and that's why they're called the Ayrshire. So these guys, are a British breed. They all have a little bit of red on them and a little bit of white. It just depends on the mix. And these, this specific breed is coveted for their efficiency in grazing. So these cows are really good at going out in the pasture and eating a bunch of grass and turning it into a bunch more milk. So they are really good at their job. That's part of the domestication of animals is humans have focused on these livestock animals efficiency so that we can use fewer resources to make the same amount of food so that it's a sustainable planet and food ecosystem long term. So that's one exciting thing about having these efficient grazers. So this cow here, her name is Meadow. Hey Meadow. She is one year old and she has been to the fair two times already. So we show our cows and take them to the county fair and the state fair, and she loves to go to the show and get her hair brushed and get a nice bath. And this is her new friend down here, Aretha. And we're really excited about Aretha because she came on a truck from Iowa for us. Our friends that also have Ayrshires out there sold her to us and we're really excited to see how she does at the fair this year. Her mom went to the World Dairy Expo, which is like the Super Bowl of cows, and won her class. So we're really excited about Aretha and her pretty spots to see how she will do. And she's very friendly. She's our little buddy. She loves to get scratched behind the ears and under her chin. She's a very cuddly girl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how big are calves usually, like when they're so brand new, spanking new? A newborn calf, depending on the breed, can weigh anywhere from 60 to 100 pounds on average. Whoa. So it just, it depends on the genetics that mom and dad had. Just like if your mom and dad are tall, you have a likelihood to be tall. 
So if the two cows that we bred together are kind of bigger, there's a much more likely chance that the calf is gonna be on that 100 pound side than on the 60 pound side. And now these animals here, Meadow probably weighs 700 pounds and Aretha probably weighs 450. Aretha. And when they are fully mature calves, they will weigh about 1,200 pounds. So they have quite a bit of growing yet to do. Yeah. Aretha is only nine months old, so she's got a lot of growing. Cows are not fully grown until they're five years old. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, so you kind of brought up some genetics. How do farmers use genetics, especially with their cattle? So there is a specific test that you can do now for cows called a genomic panel. So you send a tissue sample in from your newborn calf, just like they were gonna get their ears pierced at Claire's. It doesn't hurt them at all. It's just a little click. And you mail it into the laboratory and they assess all the DNA that's in that sample. So they map the genome of the whole cow. And so farmers take that genetic information like susceptibility to disease, longevity, so how long they think the cow will live, milk production, does she make a lot or a little? Does she make a lot of fat? Does she make a lot of protein? Because those are the nutrients in milk that we make cheese and ice cream from. So that's what's really valuable in milk. They also select for things that are a little more vanity based. So do we like tall cows or do we like shorter cows? Do I want my cow to be red or do I want my cow to be white? Um, do I like cows with a certain type of head or not? So there are a lot of different decisions that go into breeding choices, but most of them in the United States are based on commercial viability. So farmers are seeking to select an animal that is a food machine. She can take, Aretha's really friendly, isn't she? She is real friendly. Um, so a farmer can take data on this cow and say, when she eats 10 pounds of feed, she's gonna give me 10 pounds of milk back. And that's what I need to make my business sustainable. So those are a lot of the choices they're making um, right now is based on that high tech scientific development of mapping the genome and making specific choices based on what genes your cow actually carries. So the genotypic result, instead of just making choices on the phenotype, which is what's expressed in the animal. Cool, so how do they put that all together and make it happen? So it takes a lot of studying and research. So people work their whole lives to get a herd that is genetically what they want it to be. And it's always kind of changing because genetics are like a grab bag when you're rolling a dice or um, anything with chance, even though you think, all right, this tall cow and this tall cow, they're going to have a tall baby, but genetics don't always work out that way. So practice, 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 just like when you guys are getting better at tying knots or identifying different wildflowers or things like that, farmers practice how to predict genetic outcomes and look for different markers and a thing called heritability. So farmers watch over a generation what something, um, what a trait that is inherited easily by cows. So one thing that is extremely heritable or is easy to inherit is temperament. So if a farmer has a really friendly cow that he really loves, chances are he's gonna keep breeding that cow just because she's fun to be around and her offspring are also very likely to be friendly. So that is part of the reason we have Aretha that's such a buddy is She's because a buddy. for years and years, this process of domestication, farmers have been breeding their friendliest animals because they're the most fun to work with and spend time with. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a lot that goes into how you decide to make a breeding decision and what factors you might consider. So it's a serious decision whether you're breeding livestock animals or companion animals what you need to consider before you breed and what what kind of characteristics each breeding animal is going to contribute to the mating. Because we as people have an ethical responsibility to produce animals that are healthy and that we can take care of well. So it's really, really important to do your research before you decide to make a breeding. Yeah, so um, I've got a couple questions. So how 
this is kind of going back to the pug. That's so okay. how big can a pug get? There she is over there. So there is a kind of a guideline for each breed of dog called the breed standard. And that isn't always what happens in the breed. So people that have gotten together and decide, the pug is the dog for me. I love pugs, they're cute, they're good friends. They love to snuggle me on the couch when I have the cold, I'm gonna breed pugs. So then they got together and decided pugs should only be 12 to 18 pounds. And that's what size a pug should be because that's where they're at their healthiest. So there are other um, keys to a breed standard like color, angulation. So like if you look how Lulu kind of comes together at her joints, that's called angulation. So is she straight in her front? Is she kind of hocked in? That's one thing that breeders look at in the standard. So an animal that hocks in is less um, orthopedically sound, so they're more likely to have sore knees and sore hips as they get older. So that's one reason for that standard in breed and why the pug standard is no larger than 18 pounds. However, Lulu is one of those genetic anomalies that they don't always fit the standard and that's why we did not breed Lulu because she was not adhering to the standard. And how big is Lulu? Lulu is I have not weighed her recently, but I would <laughs> venture to guess about 26 pounds. Oh. So she's a little portly, but she got some new sisters last year, and they had some really yummy food, and we, we <laughs> couldn't just tell Lulu no. <laughs> so she gained a little bit of weight, but we're working this summer on getting Lulu's bikini body back. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, Gail asked what happens when the cows stop producing milk. So maybe we should head over to the yeah. big barn and talk about our big friends. Lulu is a sweet girl. She that is. is a truth. And Isabel see. is very excited to get out to this barn. She likes to hunt for mice in this barn. Yes. So. There she is fulfilling her purpose yep. as a doctor. See, there, there she, she goes. goes. Before we can even open the door. Lulu, er, Isabel is a good hunter. Okay, so now we've got the big girls. Don't know if how good the lighting is. Hi! You're so big! So okay. this white one that Tori first showed you, her name is Plum. And she is going to turn two years old next month. And she is pregnant with her first baby due in June. And then this is Marigold over here. And she is due any minute now with her third baby. Ooh. And that meadow that we looked at in the first barn, the bigger cow in there, that is Marigold's baby from last year. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we have a little family here. And um, if you notice that Marigold has a very full udder, that's um, what we call a cow's mammary glands. And if you notice, her teats are very swollen. So we think probably tonight or maybe tomorrow morning, she's gonna have her baby. She doesn't look like she's actively laboring right now. Um, but to touch a little bit about on what happens when a cow stops making milk, there are a few things that could happen and it kind of depends on who the farmer is and what, what kind of things that cow has to offer. So we talked about the genomic testing in cattle. So a lot of farmers have all the details they need to know about the genes of their cow. So if they have a cow that is really valuable genomically, she's got really great genes, she creates great babies for them that they want to have in their herd, even if she stops milking, uh, they can do what's called a flush program. So they dry the cow off, she's not giving milk anymore, but they will harvest her embryos and implant them into other cows so that they can keep carrying on her bloodline because she's such a great cow that we love. So that is one option of when a cow stops making milk. Another option is, um, unfortunately, these are businesses that are raising these farm animals and um, when we cannot use them for milk anymore, there is a viable option and that is to use them for meat. So McDonald's and Wendy's that you get your hamburgers from, those are almost all 
um, cows that used to be in the dairy production and now that they are no longer producing milk, we use them in a more uh, efficient way rather than just feeding them um, indefinitely without production. We use them as nutrition for humans. We use them in dog and cat food. Um, there are cattle products in just about everything. If you think about the leather on your purse or in your seats of your car, um, we use the cattle marrow and bones as calcium and dog food. Uh, no part of the cow goes to waste. And oftentimes when a cow stops producing milk, it's not right away. They have a nice happy life with the rest of their cow friends on the farm and, um, and they're treated very kindly when they go, uh, we kind of call it going to summer camp when they, when they, when they become harvested. <laughs> um, but every, every step of the way the animal is taken care of and uh, um, treated with respect and dignity up until that decision has to be made. So we don't want any animals languishing when they're not producing and that can kind of happen. You don't just stop getting pregnant and stop producing milk for no reason. A lot of times there's an underlying um, reason that the cow can't get pregnant or um, has stopped producing milk. So it's, it's best to use them while they are still viable uh, so that we are using our resources to produce cattle to the most efficient um, level so that we're not just wasting and wasting by using all these resources like water and land to create the feed. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about Dr. Temple? Oh, yes. So, um, when I first got this PDF, I was really excited to see Dr. Temple Grandin, uh, listed as one of the references because she is such an idol in the agricultural and specifically food animal community. So Dr. Temple Grandin is a woman who has spent her entire life studying livestock animals, specifically cattle. Uh, so that we can improve their welfare and quality of life as we're using them as food animals. So even though we are using them for milk and meat, we still want to give them a high quality of life so that they can enjoy their time here with us, get lots of scratches and pets. So Temple Grandin spent a lot of her time on animal handling. So how can we handle these cows and move them from place to place by causing the least amount of stress to them because a cow that is happy and not stressed is a cow that produces milk and a cow that is sad or scared or angry will not produce very much milk or very good tasting meat. So it's really important to farmers that we keep our animals happy. So she has discovered through her own personal um, traits that it feels really comforting to kind of get a big hug or a big squeeze. So what we have implemented when we treat cattle is what's called a squeeze chute. So we try and um, move them down a hallway that is just wide enough for them to go through so they feel like they're nice and safe and no predator can attack them. And then while we have them in the chute, we apply gentle pressure or a squeeze and it just kind of feels like if their mom was giving them a nice squeeze and laying on them, they just feel protected like nothing is going to hurt them. And then we can safely give them medical attention, vaccinations, draw blood, inspect any wounds that they might have gotten while they're out mm -hmm. in the pasture. Cattle are very prone to abscesses, which is a wound that gets infected mm -hmm. and kind of creates a pocket in the body. And that can be really painful. So if we have a safe way to treat the cow and so she doesn't feel afraid then it's a lot easier and less stressful on the cow to fix her abscess or get the rock from between her toes or give her her vaccination so she stays healthy so that is one thing in the agriculture community that we are very very thankful to temple brandon for mm -hmm. because you can treat cattle more efficiently you can get it done more quickly and the sooner you're done at the doctor's office, if you look at it that way, the sooner you're in and out of the doctor, the less stress you are. It's the same for a cow. They don't want to, you know, sit for 30 minutes so that they can get a shot. If we can get them in and out in two minutes, then they're much happier. And that is, is a great road that Temple Grandin has paved for us as animal producers. 
Awesome. Um, so Tamara, the cow is nodding. We have a confirmation that she is correct from the cow. Yes. <laughs> um, and then we have a question about how long is the gestation period for cows? So do you want to go into, what's the cow's? I forgot. So this is marigold. Marigold, okay. So the gestation is similar to the length of a human. It's about nine and a half months. So people are 40 weeks, cows are about 38. Um, they cycle just like humans do too. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, just <Okay>. like uh, <laughs> how people ovulate every 28 days, cattle ovulate every 21 days. So that is one thing that makes cattle management a little bit easier than our short day breeders like horses and sheep because they can get pregnant year round just like people can. Um, whereas, like I said, sheep, they wait for the short days of the fall to get pregnant so that they can have their babies in the springtime. And horses have an 11 month gestation, so they wait till oh, the springtime. Oh, my time. Lanta. <laughs> right, that's a long gestation. So they wait till the springtime to get pregnant so that they can have their baby again in the spring next year. Um, and then one thing that we've really come a long way with in cattle is zygote processing. So one thing that I have been working on since graduation from my bachelor's degree is um, sorting those zygotes from a one that will create a female calf to one that will create a male. So the X chromosome and the Y chromosome both have different amounts of genetic information on them. So because the Y chromosome doesn't have that kind of little leg sticking out, there's not quite as much genetic information. So the X chromosome weighs a little bit more than the Y. And so we put them on a machine that performs flow cytometry and the X's, because they're heavier, get pulled to the bottom and the Y's kind of float to what the top. What is flow psychometry? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, does it like spin or how does it? So flow cytometry is when you um, push cells through a channel. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's complicated. It's a new technology since um, the 80s, and it's really take, taken off in the last 10 or 15 years. As, as you know, you can't milk a boy cow, but you can milk a girl cow. So if we, um, if we focus on producing the females that we need and minimize the unneeded males, that's one way we can focus on improving animal welfare and respecting their rights. Um, so that we don't have as many dairy bull calves that are uh, being produced as steers, we can just produce the females that we need to, um, to replace our cows in the milking herd. But a little bit more about flow cytometry, we kind of push the cells through a channel with some fluid and um, as the computer, I get, I'm kind of tied on how I can explain it, but as the computer looks at the cells, it d decides based on that weight, okay, this cell is going to go into my tube and this cell is going to go into my trash. Um, and there's a lot of fine calibration, a lot of um, kind of physics that goes into that, but it's something that if you guys are interested in animal genetics and you think the lab opportunity might be something that you're interested in, uh, when you research after this for step five on your advocacy, I would encourage you to look into what you can do in the lab as far as animal genetics and career opportunities because it's only going to get bigger. There are more species being involved, um, more companies getting involved, and more countries getting involved. So it's a really um, scientific way that you can express your love and passion for animals. Awesome. So is Marigold, Marigold is a, what is? She's an Ayrshire. And then is? Plum, what is plum? Plum is also oh, an Ayrshire. Okay. So everything we have here now is an Ayrshire. At, at one time we used to have another breed called a brown Swiss, which is a big fluffy gray cow. So fluffy. That we love so much in our hearts. Um, but we decided to focus on one breed uh, so that we could have all our she eggs is kind of in the back. <laughs> She's so hunting. She is hunting for the mice. Um, so that we could focus on one breed and really put our attention in those genetic decisions instead of memorizing bulls and pedigrees from two breeds and trying to juggle those. Um, that way I can focus more on this one bloodline and produce better animals that way. Awesome. Um, so I think we're about 
almost done. I think we've mm -hmm. completed um, all of those badge steps. So all you guys need to do is work on some advocacy. Um, but before you guys head out, um, please post any questions you have yeah. and we'll take a couple minutes um, to answer those. And thank you, Marie and Kelly, Keely. We're having a lot of fun sharing kind of our, not like our real lives, but our lives with you guys and um, what we do kind of outside of work. So this has been a lot of fun. So any questions, I'll just keep looking at the animals for you. Yep. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you guys for spending time with me today learning about food animals and other domestic companion animals. Um, if you have any questions that you think of after the program, if you send them to Tori, I would be happy to answer anything else you guys can think of or if you stumble upon something while you're researching for your advocacy that you have a question about, I'd be more than happy to answer that too. I did think of one thing we didn't cover okay. for the cows. How do we feed, like what is their feed regimen like? Oh yeah, that's one of the most important things with cows. <laughs> So uh, cows are what's called a ruminant animal, so they have a chambered stomach. Oftentimes you'll hear that cows have four stomachs. It's actually all one operating machine, just how like in your car engine you have pistons and fuel injectors and all those different parts that make your engine run. That is the same thing with a cow's stomach, which is definitely the engine of a cow. Um, and that's what's so great about having cows domesticated is because of that highly specialized internal physiology that they have, they're able to digest feedstuffs that humans cannot. So we can't go out and munch on grass and digest any of it. It will just go right through us. Cellulose is no match for the um, human digestive system. It just doesn't really work out very well. No. So what we do by raising food animals that eat this type of food is we are using all of our land to the best of our ability. So land that is arable for vegetables and fruit and things that you buy at the grocery store, we are using and growing vegetables and fruit, pumpkins, all those fun type of things on that type of land. But there's some land that's just not very good for growing vegetables or uh, mm -hmm. the things we like to eat at the store, but it's really, really good at growing just plain grass. Um, especially really hilly, rocky areas are hard to grow yeah. crops on. But mm -hmm. if you can harvest that grass or turn your cows out on that pasture, it's an efficient way to use that land without taking a food source from humans so that we can kind of work together and using our Earth's resources judiciously and uh, cows eat a lot of food. You yeah, they do. believe it. So a cow marigold size eats almost 100 pounds of dry matter every day. So Ooh. dry matter is what we call food without including the moisture in it. So we don't um, really weigh corn by just what it weighs. We're talking about the dry matter to look at the nutrition that that cow is getting. Um, so she eats things like this long grassy hay that we have that we harvested out in this field right by our house. Mm -hmm. And they also eat um, different grains. So we can show the grain. Yeah, we can head out. Bye, cows. We're going to go take a look at the grain. And then while we're walking, what's the difference between hay and straw? So hay is a cut and dried grass that is churned into a bale. And that's something that cows can eat. And then straw is a bedding for cows. So that is the waste product when people harvest wheat. Mm, so cut. you cut off the top part of the wheat and that's the wheat germ. And that's what we use to make flour, bread, anything like that. And then the stalk that the plant grows on or the stem, that's what we use as straw for animal bedding. It's really warm and really insulating. So it's a great thing to use for Oops. their bedding. Um, and here we have some of their feed. If you notice, it's kind of reddish brown because it has molasses mixed in. Yeah, it smells really sweet. So that entices the cows to eat it because it smells nice and sweet. And then if we'll look at some different pieces. Here is some of the corn. If you see that kind of yellow cracked bit, this is what's called a protein pellet. So little pieces of soybean were ground up and compressed into like a little kibble. 
And then these are what oats look like before they get rolled out for your oatmeal. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Huh. So that's what we have in there for them. And then it all sticks together with that molasses to make it taste good. And so this is where they get their calories from and the hay is where they uh, get their fiber from. So just like people need a lot of fiber in their diet to stay regular, cows need even more. Yeah, yes. And let me tell you, mucking this out is <laughs> super fun. Ha. Huh. Super fun. Yeah. Um, any other little bits? Any questions? I still haven't seen any questions. So um, I think we are officially, officially done now. Um, so if you guys want to leave any questions or comments um, just under this video, um, and I will go through and um, answer them and get them to Alex so she can answer them. Um, thank you all for joining. Have a great weekend.